You're listening to the Erica and McAfee podcast, a faith-based podcast for black women and women of color to share stories of grief and loss due to miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, with journeys of trying to conceive and infertility. Welcome to episode 19 of the Erica and McAfee podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by The Honeypot Company. Did you know that there was a Black-owned, plant-based feminine care company? The Honeypot Company's goal is to educate, support, and provide women around the world with the tools and resources that promote feminine health and wellness. I was first introduced to The Honeypot Company through a Curlbox body and received their 3-in-1 sensitive wraps. I loved them so much I had to go out and repurchase. To learn more about the Honeypot Company and to get a discount on their products, visit EricaMcAfee.com forward slash honey for more information. In today's episode, Tanika Dillard shares her recurrent pregnancy loss story, including second trimester losses and a stillbirth. Tanika Dillard is a natural leader, motivational speaker, and trusted counselor to her peers. She is a credentialed certified birth and bereavement doula, where she offers compassionate physical, emotional, and spiritual support to expectant families in any trimester and any birth outcome. Tanika's passion for breaking the silence of pregnancy loss positioned her as a founding member and facilitator for Share Upstate Pregnancy and Infant Loss Support Group. Her efforts to honor the lives of her children and increase awareness on the taboo subject have uniquely connected her with medical professionals and grieving families across the globe. In August 2014, Tanika embarked upon a new phase in the literary revolution by releasing Building a Family Breaks My Heart, a best-selling novel inspired by her blog writings. Building a Family Breaks My Heart is a magnificent work of heart, capturing the essence of despair from loss and the beauty of dreams fulfilled. The novel is sure to capture and connect the hearts of those who have experienced pregnancy loss, infertility, or supporters of those who have. And I personally set up all night and read Building a Family That Breaks My Heart before this interview, and it touched me so much. I was so excited to get Tanika on this um, podcast, as well as for you all to learn about her story, learn about the work that she's doing with Share Upstate, and then also go find her on the internet. She did a TED talk, which was awesome, which I'll make sure that I link um, in the show notes. But here is Tanika Dillard. Well, thank you, Tanika, for being a part of the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here with you. All right. So as I As we get started, um, I'd like for my guests to tell a little bit about yourself um, and then go into your lost story. Okay, so again, my name is Tanika Dillard. I am from South Carolina. Uh, Most importantly, I am a wife um, to an amazing man, uh, Christopher Dillard. And I'm going to put a little plug in here. We will be married 11 years uh, this coming weekend. So awesome. I'm very excited. Awesome. And uh, to love such an amazing king and priest. So um, I'm proudly a wife. I'm the mother of six. Uh, my husband and I get to parent two of those six. Uh, we have two boys. They're seven and four. Um, I'm a TED Talk speaker. I'm a support group founder and leader here in Greenville, South Carolina for Share Upstate Pregnancy and Infant Loss, and I'm a best-selling author. In my spare time, I enjoy just being totally um, immersed in my family, singing hymns, and photography. Those are the things that I love to do in my spare time. So, um, transitioning to our lost story... I like to say that our loss story really begins with love and not loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, My husband and I were one year into our marriage, and we were totally excited to be pregnant and didn't know what we were having, but we were completely in love from the day that we saw two lines on the pregnancy test. Uh, We had a perfect pregnancy. I had no morning sickness, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, that perfect pregnancy quickly became high risk when my water broke. It 
born. And our daughter, Destiny, died at 18 weeks, and that was in December of 2007. Three months later, we were pregnant again, um, and my cervix began to fail at 17 weeks. And I was admitted to the hospital for an emergency surcage to save the pregnancy, and this unsuccessful attempt led to the death of our second daughter, Brianna, in July of 2008. Um, so after her death, I was diagnosed with incompetent cervix. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing wrong at all with my daughters. It was just my body wasn't strong enough to carry the weight of the pregnancy. And this is what we share in common, um, Tanika, is that I, I had also had an incompetent cervix on my second loss. And I had my second loss of a, a daughter who was Brielle at 18 weeks. Amazing, mm -hmm. the similarity to that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that diagnosis of incompetent cervix, I researched all of my options because I didn't want to keep going through loss after loss after loss. Um, so I wanted to find out what my options were for a viable pregnancy for the future. Um, so I met with my high-risk maternal fetal medicine doctor, and we were armed with a plan. We knew that we'd get pregnant, that I'd be followed every two weeks, by the high-risk OB, and that I have a surprise placed at 12 weeks, and that at 38 weeks, I'd be bringing a baby home. That was the plan, and we were not deviating from it. Right. So everything we was planned, 12 weeks, I had the surprise placed, but at 19 weeks, my cervix began to fail, even with the surprise in place. Mm -hmm. um, so my daughter Madison was born in July of 2009, and she lived for nine hours before she died and joined her sister. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how devastated we were um, that this perfect plan that we had failed. Mm -hmm. um, but I did some research, and I wanted to find out who the expert was that could deal with and treat an incompetent cervix. And I found a wonderful, amazing physician in Chicago Dr. Arthur Haney at the University of Chicago, who has been specializing in um, abdominal cerclages for over 30 years. And I had a cerclage placed with him, and he said, go wait three months, and then you're free to try again. And so almost, you know, 90 days <laughs> to the to the T, uh, we were pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we welcomed son, Ethan, um, in August of 2010. He was our first take-home baby. Um, just an amazing journey. Um, having him experiencing all the joys of a pregnancy and from that moment on, you know, the moment that we held him, we heard him cry, we knew in our heart that our story of loss was behind us. Mm -hmm. One thing that said to me um, during our phone consult, he said, after you have the surprise, your journey of loss is behind you. You can have all of the kids that you want. And I was like, yes, sir. You know, I'm on my way to right. have a baby mom. Um, so we never, we put out that we would never, that we would have another loss. Well, six months into, um, Ethan's life, we were pregnant again by surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> pregnant and um, I was already four months pregnant when we found out okay oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was a pregnancy for everybody um, but the pregnancy was great I continued with the same plan being followed up by my high risk doctors and everything was great up until my very last ultrasound before my c-section I went in and there was no heartbeat and our son, Israel Grayson, was born December 8th um, of 2011. And he was a full-term still, stillbirth because the cord was wrapped around his neck. Mm. So an absolute shock to our family, our community. You know, we were not supposed to be associated with loss again. Mm -hmm. um, and my husband said, you know, if you don't want to try again, I understand we don't have to do this again. And I said, absolutely, I am going to do it again because I'm not ending on a loss. Mm. You know, we've lost a lot, but we haven't lost everything that we can't start over. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't know how long we would wait. 
you know, and the doctor said, you know, take a year. And I was like, I'm not waiting a year, but, you know, we'll just let our hearts guide us into the timing of when we will try again. And I knew it was time um, in the summer of 2012. My husband and I had just come back from a vacation in Cancun, and we stopped at the gas station, and my husband was pumping gas, and he suddenly just stopped, and he started following. His eyes were following a lady carrying a newborn baby. And he just watched her walk into the store. He, com- he was completely frozen. And I was watching him like, what is going on with him? And when he got in the car, he said, did you see that little baby? And I was like, yeah, it looks like, the, you know, it's a newborn, like just a couple of days old, how tiny it was. Mm-hmm. And he was just, oh, man, you know, I just, I just love that. I love seeing newborns. And for me, that was the message to say, it's time to try again. Mm-hmm. And so nine months later, our second son, Evan, was born. So that's the 50,000-foot view of our lost story. But it has been quite um, uh, a journey of highs and lows and gains and losses. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. It has made me a better person. It has made our marriage stronger, our faith um, deeper. And... The people that we have come into relationship with and have been able to support have been amazing. So our children's lives make a difference every day. Every time we're able to share their story and to offer hope, their lives matter. And they are, they continue to be validated when we're able to help others. Awesome. So... Um, let's talk about your book, um, because your book goes into a lot more detail about your losses, your thought process, your journals. You even have journal entries in there, which I thought was amazing for us to actually get into kind of your head on where you were during and in between your losses. So let's talk about your book. Building a family breaks my heart is the book that I'm referring to. (laughs) So let's talk about that. (laughs) Okay, so Building a Family Breaks My Heart started out as a blog. Um, I've always enjoyed, you know, expressing feelings, usually with poetry or in, you know, music, writing songs, what have you, but writing a book was never on my bucket list, ever. Mm -hmm. But after um, Madison, after Destiny died, excuse me, you know, I couldn't sleep. I had restless nights, and I didn't want to keep waking my husband up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to talk about, you know, the fact that my breasts were leaking and I didn't have a baby to feed or, you know, whatever was going on emotionally with me. But I had a million thoughts in my head, mm-hmm. and I needed to get them out. So I would come into my office and just start writing out my truest feelings. Mm-hmm. And I loved it because, you know, it's my most authentic, authentic self sharing my truest emotions. And I'm, I was doing that without the pressure of holding anything back for the sake of how other people would feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just poured my heart out, you know, just me and the keyboard and the monitor, you know, about how I felt. And, you know, I published the blog and people would you know, comment and would say, you know, hey, I know exactly how you feel. Um, I've experienced this too, but I've never told anyone, you know, you're really helping me. You should, you should publish this book. You know, you should make this into a book. And I was like, oh no, I'm fine just being a blog writer. You know, I enjoy that. You know, only a few people have access to it. I'm cool with that. Um, And after our second loss, I think I just started, I opened up another layer of my heart to really pour out you know, another level of what I felt. And what I realized is those blog followers and my friends, they were really echoing the voice of God Mm -hmm. who had been saying, write a book, you know, share your story. Mm -hmm. And I downplayed that. And I said, who wants to hear this? You know, (laughs) who wants to hear about a lady losing all of her baby? And the more and more... You know, I tried to fight it. I would hear more and more, you really need to put this into a book. So after 
Madison died after our third loss. I was like, okay, I'm going to start. I'm just going to start writing a book, and whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. So I started the book, um, and it took me two years to publish it Mm -hmm. because I would write some, and then I would heal some. You know, I'm, I'm, I remember in color, if that makes sense, you know, mm-hmm. I remember the color of my doctor's eyes. I remember what people have on, you know, I just remember in detail. And so whenever I would write, I would go back until that, to that very moment. Mm-hmm. What I, what I realized in that writing was I was so focused on having another baby to cover up my pain mm. that I never dealt with the grief. Oh, so wow. in between in between the pages of building a family breaks my heart, you can't see it, but it's there. In between those pages, there's healing that took place in between those pages. Because I didn't stop my plan of having babies in order to grieve and to heal. But as I went back to write you know, and I wrote about all of that pain. The Lord was like, okay, stop. Will you stop now and allow me to heal you? Mm-hmm. And there were times that I would write, you know, a chapter, and I would walk away from that book for two months so that the Lord could pour his oil into my soul mm-hmm. so that I could recover and that I could heal so that I could take this bro- this message of brokenness and what seems to be hopelessness and turn it into something that's going to help someone else. Mm. So I wasn't rushed to get it done. I knew that it would come out at the exact time that it needed to. And it's been confirmed over and over again that it came out on just the right day at just the right time. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, you know, I, and I just, I told you before we started this podcast that I sat and read it in one session because I was just so in awe and I was just so blessed, you know, um, being, you know, six, five years from my loss, my loss of my first son, I, you know, some things come back up in your spirit. And like you said, you know, you, you took your time out to write, to heal, but to read someone else's words and read someone else's blog entries and to understand that pain and that, that deep, you know, that anxiety, those fears, you know, the questioning of God, you know, all of that written out so eloquently in telling your story was just such a blessing to me as well. So for those of you all who are listening, you know, she kind of gave a good overview of her losses, but to go into more detail of what she was thinking and how her and her family dealt with, with her losses, you all need to read this book. It is amazing. <laughs> so that's my little that's testimony. Right. <laughs> it is Thank amazing. It is amazing. So a lot of our listeners out there, they may have just experienced a miscarriage or a loss. And they are kind of on a fence of beginning to try again, you know, starting to try to conceive. What was your motivation? What, how was your faith walk that continued to push you to continue to try? Because, you you know, that's hard. That's a hard decision to make. That's hard to continue to move past that fear and that anxiety and thoughts that you couldn't lose another baby, especially when you have an incompetent cervix to try again. Exactly. Exactly. So that that is a loaded question, um, and I'll start with um, you know what motivated me to try again first. Um, I just I didn't want to be a mother when I got married. Be- becoming a mother had been a lifelong dream for me since I was like five, mm-hmm. literally. Um, so by the time I was in the ninth grade, I had all my children's names written out. I knew that I was going to be a mom. Right. You know, I didn't, I just knew that, that I was going to be a mother. So the fact that we lost our first pregnancy didn't stop me from that dream that had been, um, being birthed in me since I was five. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I had a lot of anger, with God, you know, after the second loss, and I didn't understand why, and I, you know, had my anger with him, but I was still determined that I was going to be a mother. Um, The journey for me became a journey of a decision. Mm -hmm. Every day, I would have to look in the mirror and choose faith 
over fear. Mm. You know, for anybody that's had a loss, you know that, you know, we listen to our body intently. Right. You know, any change, any change, we, we're the first to notice. You know, if there's less movement, if we feel sick one day and don't feel sick the next day, we immediately, you know, go to Google and start researching symptoms, you know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that. I mean, and I was literally making myself sick by thinking the worst. What if this happens? You know, what if I start bleeding? What if whatever? And I just had to say, look, either I'm going to trust God or I'm not. Mm. Period. Um, and so when I would feel myself spiraling out of control, I would say, Tanika, are you going to choose faith? Are you going to choose fear? And I waited for an answer. And there were, there were days where I had to repeat that question over and over again. Will you choose faith or will you choose fear? So for those that are, you know, you have a loss in the, in the past and you are totally gripped with fear, you're thinking, you know, what if I get pregnant again and what if I lose another baby? I'm not here to offer you false hope. It can happen. It happened to me. But what if you get pregnant again and what if you bring home a baby that's alive? You never know what you're able to do until you do it. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, if, if your dream, if your goal is to become a mother, to have children, don't let one loss overshadow the power of a dream. Dream and determination are much more powerful than fear ever could be. Mm -hmm. You have to make your fear work for you, not you, you don't work with your fear. You have to make fear work for you. So whenever those thoughts come in your mind to say, what if I lose a baby? You have to make that, that fear work for you. And that's when your faith kick, kicks in and say, you know what? Even if I lose, I'm, I, it's not going to be because I don't try. You know, you become your, your best cheerleader um, in these moments. And I encourage anybody who is wavering between decisions right now today, ask yourself, what is more important to you, faith or fear? And make a list. Get out a piece of paper, write faith on one side and fear on one side. What can your faith do? What can your faith produce and what can your fear produce and weigh your options, weigh your options, what's more important to you? So that's, that's my, my challenge to those that are thinking of, um, you know, embarking on the journey of, of trying again. Ask yourself the question, the question, faith versus fear, and you decide if you're on team faith. Or team fear. Those are excellent questions to ask yourself throughout that journey. So let's talk about your your certified your certified and your credentialed as a birth and bereavement doula. Can we talk about what a doula is and then what what you did as a birth and bereavement doula? Okay, perfect. So um, a doula, uh, specifically a birth and bereavement doula is um, someone who comes alongside of the pregnant woman and, and her family. It's not just for the, the pregnant woman, but to support the family before, during, and after the birth of the baby. So we're not, you know, the physician that delivers the baby. We're not, you know, the midwife, but we are there to provide the physical and emotional support for those that are birthing a baby. The bereavement doula has an extra special role in that the doula preserves memories um, of the baby and, and does that incorporating the mom, the dad, the siblings, et cetera. What's most important um, is that the, doula, the bereavement doula sits down with the family prior to the birth to develop a birth plan, to talk about, you know, what is it that you want to do for this baby once the baby is born? You know, do you want to bathe the baby? Do you want to wash the baby's hair? Do you want to 
dress the child, you know, all of the things that you want to do, that bereavement doula is there to write out all of the plans so that when that baby is born, there's not a professional in your face asking you to make decisions. The bereavement doula is there to make sure that every moment that you have with that child is about you making memories with that baby rather than making decisions and taking you taking you out of that element. Um, so the birth and bereavement certification came through a wonderful organization called stillbirthday.com, stillbirthday.com. Um, and the lady that founded it experienced the death of her son and she wanted to do something to empower, you know, other women to um, be a support, come alongside those that will walk the journey of grief um, and just to make us better aware of the needs of the grieving community and how to support those, those families. What was that website again? So we can make sure we put it in the description box and in the show notes. Yes. It's still birthday, S T I L L birthday.com. And what that, that means is although your child passed away, they still have a birthday. They still have a life that's worth celebrating. Um, so that's how she came up with that name. What are some resources that are out there or that you use during your loss journey and for other lost moms? Okay. There are thousands of resources out there. Um, one that I strongly recommend, and this is a national organization um, of which we started our organization from in South Carolina. It's called National Share Pregnancy and Infant Loss Support Group. Mm-hmm. And that website is nationalshare.org. So no matter where you are, you can go to National Share and you can connect on that website and it will connect you with local support groups in your area. So one thing that was most helpful for me um, with starting out with our um, grief support is the fact that you know, I wanted to talk to somebody, you know, online support is great, but I wanted to talk to somebody, Mm -hmm. you know, it's different, you know, online support is wonderful because they're there at two or three o'clock in the morning when you're awake, but you don't get the, um, the emotional, physical support, um, through the online resources. So I advocate for, support relationships. You know, there's nothing like sitting around a room um, of other grieving families and who may be at different aspects of their their grief journey, but just to sit beside another mother or another father that's grieving and just to put your hand on their hand or put your hand on their back to say, I understand. You're not alone. That connection is powerful. Mm-hmm. So I encourage twofold connection. You know, get connected with a, an online support group, and there are numerous, you know, to choose from. But then also go to nationalshare.org and find a local support group in your area where you can physically go and make connections and build relationships um, with other people that have experienced loss. One thing that you will find in the lost community that you may go in and think, you know, I have very little to offer. I'm just coming to cry and to tell my story. But once you get there, you find that there are other people just like you that can relate to your pain. And you guys develop a relationship that really blossoms into something. So when you are, when you're able to give voice to your pain, you, you actually are putting out a call um, to say, look, support me and let me support you. It's, it's a mutual exchange. So um, in addition to support groups, I advocate for bereavement conferences. There are numerous conferences um, around the U.S. Mm-hmm. There's one specifically coming up here uh, in South Carolina next month. It's called Hope and Help for the Holidays and Beyond. Okay. And they always, it's wonderful, hope and help for the holidays and beyond is the conference. Um, but they specifically talk about the loss of a child. Mm. 
Um, and then another resource, there's numerous books. Of course, Building a Family Breaks My Heart. Shameless plug for that. Um, <laughs> get that. There are, uh, you know, a lot of websites. But I think if you go to nationalshare.org, it can be just a hub to get you to other resources um, that can help. What encouraging or inspiring words can you give to the other lost moms out there? The first piece of advice I would give, and it's going to sound very simple, but it's very powerful. And that is just to breathe. Mm. To breathe. Take a moment. Realize where you are. How you got there. To breathe and to remember how far you've come. For the, for the lost moms, you've experienced the worst. And the worst is behind you and you've lived through it. So just take a breath. Get a second wind. And plan your next step. It sounds very simple. But one thing that we forget to do when we're grieving is to breathe. I know it's an involuntary action, but we carry so much stress and anxiety that we just forget to do the simple thing is to breathe. The second thing is don't apologize for your feelings. The first thing that usually people do when they break down and cry about their child is say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't apologize. Own that. You know, when you reframe your reference of grief, you realize that grief is a byproduct of love. And Zig Ziglar said it best in a quote that says, if there were no love, there would be no grief. Mm. If there were no love, there would be no grief. So grief is a byproduct of love. And so however you show that grief, don't apologize for it because your tears are a sign of love. And when you look at it that way, you feel liberated to cry if you need to. And lastly, I encourage women and men, moms and dads, to break the silence. Mm -hmm. I can't echo that enough, mm -hmm. that there are so many people that carry the weight of loss and it, they keep it to themselves because there is shame associated with it, with it, there's guilt associated with it. Mm -hmm. But if there's one message that I can encourage you to do, that is to break the silence. When you do that, you will be amazed at the army of support that will just come alongside you and say, I understand. I've lost a baby too. Whatever it is, break your silence and allow other people to walk alongside you to change the, to turn the page in your grief. Where can we find you on social? On social media, um, you can find my, my page as Building a Family Breaks My Heart um, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If you want to purchase um, any of my products, uh, the book, or I have um, a sacred lullaby as well. Both of those are available on Amazon. You can just type in my name into Amazon and you can see the products that are available. And I will make sure that I link have direct links of all of those in the description box as well as the show notes. Thank you so much, Tanika, for sharing your story and sharing your light on the podcast. I, it's such a blessing. And like I said, those who are listening, you need to go get this book, Building a Family Breaks My Heart. You need to go purchase it and read it and get just hump, just get blessed by her message and what God has done through her and her. Erica, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I pray that the show was inspirational and a blessing to you. The show notes and links for today's podcast can be found on Erica and McAfee.com forward slash podcast episodes. Now it's time for you to tell your story. Visit ericamcafee.com for more information on how to be a part of the show. You can follow me on social at Erica and McAfee everywhere on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I would love for you to join the community. We need your feedback on the Erica and McAfee podcast. For those of you listening in iTunes, please go to iTunes and rate and review the show. Keep the faith and I will talk to you next Wednesday.